Welcome back to the Anxiety Slayer podcast. I'm Shan Vanderleek here with my wonderful friend and co-host Ananga Sivir. We come together weekly from Kent and Leelanau to share Anxiety Slayer sessions with you and answer listener questions from our inbox and Facebook page, as well as our private group. Together, we share a powerful collection of techniques to reduce anxiety. Hello, Ananga. Hey, Shan. This week, we're talking about words to ban from your self-talk if you want to remain free from anxiety. I'm glad that we're doing this because this is actually a subject we haven't talked about. And it's incredibly supportive to learn how to manage your self-talk. Absolutely. And with anxiety, it can be particularly forceful. The voices that come into our head and the dialogue that comes into our head comes in with a pretty powerful energy sometimes. And we end up at the mercy of it rather than realizing that there are things we can do to change these thoughts and words that break in. That makes me think of a really powerful quote by Hafiz. The words you speak become the house you live in. Mm. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, I think it's worth writing such quotes out and keeping them in a prominent place and revisiting them. And, you know, the, the first thing with anxiety is to understand that we can remodel the house. Right. We can remodel the house by changing the bricks of our languaging. And just knowing that that's possible, it's not easy. And it's something we have to continually work on, but it is possible. And it completely changes our day to day experience of our life when we know we can do that and we start taking steps to do it. Let's talk about the two primary phrases that hold us in anxiety that we need to be on the lookout for. The first one is the classic, why me? Oh, yeah. Why me? Why is this happening to me? And reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Edith Eager, who is an incredible psychologist and Auschwitz survivor, author of a remarkable book called The Choice, which I read last year. And Dr. Edith says, don't ask why me, ask what now? And she tells some powerful stories of her observations of survival in fellow uh, prisoners in Auschwitz, according to their mindset, Um, those that were more willing to take action and try and do whatever they could to get through the, the hell they were in. And she's a remarkable teacher and author. So for me, that's a very powerful teaching of hers. Don't ask why me ask what now, which moves us, of course, from feeling at the, at the mercy of our anxiety to thinking, okay, what action can I take? Right. Often during difficult times, we ask, why me? The mind's very quick to go there. Or we stop to state that we don't like what's happening to us. And that's fine. That's natural to say it once or twice to those we trust or to note it on a page in our journal is a healthy statement of fact. It's how we're feeling and we need to honor and acknowledge how we're feeling and not stuff our feelings down. But the challenge with the mind is that it tends to get snared on those thoughts and it keeps replaying them. And we'll just solidify this objection, this resentment. And then these thoughts become a disempowering belief and it holds us in objection and they stop us taking action. And There isn't one person on the planet that wants to stay in that loop, that replay of whatever it is that they're suffering through. That's why this entire year we're talking about how to take action and to remind you that there are things that you can do no matter what your mind tells you. And language is the painter of our psychological experiences. If we think and talk hope, we will feel hopeful. But if our thoughts and dialogue are rooted in anxiety and fear, then we will feel fearful. We will feel anxious. And we'll behave anxiously and grow even more anxiety because we're feeding that anxiety at the root. Self-talk, I mean, it's just so incredibly powerful and 
once you realize that, once you're aware of it, you can really start to change your inner dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. And action is key. And it's really hard when we feel low and we feel mentally exhausted. It's so hard to push through and take that action. But some way, somehow, we need to find the inspiration to do it, Mm -hmm. whether it's in looking at others who've come through anxiety, listening to podcasts, reading, hanging out in a private group with proactive peers, really important not to fall into the trap of anxiety that is bad bonding, where we just ask, who else gets this? Again, it's okay to ask it once or twice, and it's natural to ask it once or twice. Yeah, Who else feels like this? And then we feel some, oh, I'm not alone. That's fine. That's good. But we have to go beyond that. There's a Vedic uh, story, a wisdom teaching story that I really like about two frogs in a well, and the well happens to have milk in it rather than water. So they're both kicking away, trying to get out. And one of them just gets tired. He gets tired of kicking. He doesn't think he can get out and he goes under. And the other one just keeps kicking away. He keeps kicking away his little back legs. And then suddenly at a certain point, the milk starts to turn to cream and it gets thicker and he kicks some more and some more and then it turns to butter and he's out. He gets the traction to jump out. Mm. I love teachings like this. We just need some inspiration to just keep trying. Right. Keep going, keep looking for what helps us. And when we have mindsets, mind words come up that aren't serving us well, to just stop and ask, okay, this is how I feel. And I have compassion for myself, but is it helpful? Is it taking me in the right direction? And then we need to make a choice about what words we need to change, what words we can improve. Mm -hmm. The other primary phrase that holds us in anxiety is what if, because often we're completely unaware that the chatter running in our head is feeding our anxiety, but our inner dialogue is affecting our body and our sense of peace at every moment. And what if thoughts are absolutely some of the worst offenders? Terrible. What if they are, they're just, and we can create these stories as you know, Ananga, because you and I have both created them. Yeah. Where one seed thought turns into a freaking apocalypse and you're just like, wow, look at where I just went. So fast, you know, it just happens like wildfire. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. These what if thoughts are future based fears and they arise from anxiety about something happening down the line that we dread or that we can't control, but it isn't happening now. It's just a script we're running. and. As mentioned, we're writing a disaster movie and making ourselves the, uh, the leading role, the star player in, the, in that particular film. Yeah. So easy for the mind to gather momentum and do this. Disturbingly easy. And I like the example you used, Chan, of a wildfire, because that really is, to me, the energy that rips through the mind. Let's talk about what helps when we're running that what-if script in our minds. Something I learned years ago from Buddhist psychology, which was incredibly helpful to me, is to actively draw yourself back to the present moment, to stop when you notice the what-if thoughts are coming in or you just see yourself running down that, that road of creating a story that you really don't want to be in, but your mind's going for the details, to stop, notice. Take a breath and remind yourself that this is just a story. It's just a story. Nothing's happened yet. And then to bring your attention to where you are and what you're doing. Fix your mind on the simplest fact of where you are and what you're doing at this moment. And to ask yourself, take it very literally, ask yourself, where am I and what am I doing? To come away from future fiction and bring yourself into present. Um, So, for example, right now I'm sitting in my room talking to my friend, recording a podcast. That's it. That's all I know right now in this moment. And that also helps you come to the space of understanding that right now you're okay. You are there. You're in your room. We're having a conversation and you are okay. Yeah, that's the what is in this moment. 
from doing this. It also helps us be very much more present with ourselves and with each other. So a side benefit of calming the anxiety is that we become more associated into our present moment experience and we become more available in relationships. You know, when we're really anxious, people will often say, it's like you're not quite there, you, you, you know, are you okay? You're checked out. Sometimes people suffering from anxiety, they get very concerned about their relationships. So this really helps when you're seated with others and your mind's running off to just think, okay, where am I? What am I doing? And some years ago, I practiced this when I was visiting a friend and I'd had a flu. I was really sick and uh, coming out the other side well enough to go and be with somebody. And I visited a friend and we were sitting in her lovely lounge on a rug on the floor, drinking mint tea together and chatting. And I was thinking, I'm not here. I was looking at her, but I couldn't, I couldn't connect. And I was like, oh, I think this is because... I'm a bit disassociated from being sick. So I put my hand down in the rug on the floor and felt the rug. And it's like, okay, I'm here sitting on this rug, talking to my friend. I really honed in on her face, tuned into her voice. Okay, in this moment, I'm here and I'm okay. And I became more present with her. So really helpful practice to keep trying it until it becomes second nature. Well, and in that case, you were able to come back to the present moment and be a part of the situation and conversation and, and be with her, which also had to help you create some peace of mind uh, and calm your anxiety or disassociation that you were feeling just by grounding. Isn't it something how you can just get your, your fingers in the, in the rug or whatever? It re- reminds me of a sweat lodge ceremony that I was in where I just needed to feel my fingers in the dirt. Um, the, the ground was covered, but I'm inside. It's hot. It's dark. It was causing a little bit of anxiety. And what I needed to do is feel the earth in my fingers. And I did. And I you know, reached for them. And, and in that moment, I felt grounded. In that moment, I knew I was just fine. And I wasn't going to let that story take me away. And that's the key, isn't it? Not letting the story take me away. Seeing it's a story, because the mind will have you believe it's fact. Yeah. Or it's a potential outcome that we so dread and so fear so seeing it as no this is a story and I can change I wrote it (laughs) exactly exactly I wrote it at horrible lightning speed and with horrible detail technical detail my mind can spin a story like that so fast it amazes me but sometimes these days I can just smile at it and just laugh it's like this is just a story I wrote it now it really needs some editing you know it's a it's a bad first draft (laughs) Yeah, because whatever comes, you know how to shape it, how to edit it, how to handle it so that you can move beyond that story and and create a new story. Yeah, which is the power of coming back to the present moment. What we do next has a direct impact on the story and on our future when we stop and pause. And we might not be able to control outcomes and situations We can't control everything, and that's at the root of much of our anxiety is that we're not powerful controllers. But we can build peace of mind, and we can follow proven steps to help calm our anxiety and increase resilience. Then whatever comes, we're in better shape to handle it. And when we live in anxiety, we're fighting with our own mind. Mm. And we become exhausted when we do that. So learning how to respond with this deeper understanding of the mind and the tricks that it plays is, you know, talk about winning. It's the first (laughs) step in diffusing fear. It it really, truly is. We like to celebrate the small things, but this is actually a big thing when you can feel greater peace and self-assurance. It's uh, definitely something to celebrate. It's significant. These things are significant. You know, if we're becoming exhausted in the fight, we're frog number one. Mm. And if we can learn to respond and, you know, just keep, keep trying to not push through in a sense of pushing against ourselves and our needs, but keep trying to take action, positive action. Right. Then we're frog number two. <laughs> right. And eventually we'll gain some traction and we'll feel some ground to stand on and then we can, we can move forward. Let's talk about what happens at night, perhaps before we go to bed or when 
we wake up in, in the middle of the night and with that pregnant head, you know, with that mind full of stories. Night thoughts. Night thoughts are scary, aren't they? They've got their own way of breaking in and quite significant energy. Sometimes our mind kicks in with the thoughts and words we've been trying to suppress all day. Mm -hmm. The things we're avoiding, don't want to think about that. We don't want to think about that. We don't want to deal with, with this. And then at night we might wake up and it's just all there waiting for us and it can come down like, like dominoes. It downloads so quickly. And at such times we can feel completely overwhelmed by our thoughts and at the mercy of, of anxiety. But uh, Ayurveda, India's ancient science of life, teaches that the qualities in our environment shift at night, the different energies at play throughout the day and the night. And at night, they shift to an energy that's more prone to fearful thinking, mm -hmm. more prone to us having a low mood and feeling less resilient, more anxious. And understanding this with self-compassion and knowing that things often feel better with the rising sun, it helps. It's helpful to know that it isn't a fault with us. Right. You know, we're being affected by the time of, of day and night and our environment. But when we're living with anxiety, we need to be prepared. Right. We need to have things in place to help us because night anxiety can really break in and cause great fear and disturbance. It sure can. I, and I think that's one of the reasons why you and I are our nightstands are very well equipped <laughs> to support us because we know what to do. And, and when these things do happen and I just am coming off of, of a night, uh, not so much a, an anxious night as a sleepless night. Mm -hmm. And then the, the sleeplessness can cause anxiety if you, if you don't nip it in the bud and, and care for yourself. And, and so this is an important recipe for your uh, nighttime ritual or planning or preparation is to keep some Bach flower rescue remedy by your bed. I always have a glass of water by my bed. Lavender is incredibly helpful for sleeping. Something you can diffuse or put a little bit on your wrists and on your chest. And if you find that unwanted anxious thoughts wake you up, this is a good time to put the light on. Or if you're sharing a room with someone else, move to a place where you can sit in the light. And practice long exhale breathing. Use the calming point. Do what you know works to help settle yourself, settle your mind. Ananga, I know you have some tried and true methods that you use. Uh, you want to share yours? Yeah, I have a little portable <laughs> arrangement that's with me wherever I go. And when I was in hospital, it was. Uh right on my belly in my bed at night. So these things have really helped me over the years and I, I always have them with me. I have an MP3 player and a calming book with me, along with Rescue Remedy and, and Lavender and my meditation beads. But for night thoughts, I really like to have a book by my bed. So I have something right there to hand to fill my mind with uplifting thoughts instead of the ones my mind will try and replay if it gets its own way. So to replace my own internal propaganda <laughs> with yeah. something more wholesome, more uplifting. And I find reading with full attention, really mindfully reading, calms my mind very quickly when I need to, to switch states. So I always have a book by my bed at night and my MP3 player also. Often I'll choose to move to another space and put a lamp on or make some herbal tea. Uh, I'd rather wake up and reset myself than lay there with my mind getting the upper hand. So often I'll choose to move, same as we recommend with anxiety in the daytime. And if I need help getting back to sleep, then I'll listen to a guided breathing practice or a guided meditation for sleep to keep the thoughts at bay while I drift back off. Those are also powerful. And you, you feel so much better when you have the tools that you need, that you know work for you. I do many of the same things that you do at night. Uh, I keep an essential oil blend that I love so much. It's a combination of lavender, sandalwood, and lang lang. And it's just, for me, the very perfect scent that helps me 
get back to being calm and relax and I'll put some on my feet and I'll put some on my wrists and on my chest. I also like to listen to uh, 432 hertz music or guided relaxations to help me relax again and come back down. Uh, Often I will just get up and go sit in the light, as we mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. maybe do a little bit of reading, uh, make some hot, you know, some warm almond milk Mm -hmm. with a pinch of nutmeg, or maybe, maybe make some chamomile tea. I don't tend to want to, uh, to drink in the, in the middle of the night, but when I do, it actually helps. (laughs) So I am open, I'm open to doing that. And then we also have some resources that would be helpful for you if you are in this space of really wanting to have better control of your mind. It's a course that is one of our most popular, and it's called How to Calm Your Fragile Mind, Finding Freedom from Unwanted Thought. We receive questions all the time asking us to teach more about this and how you can move beyond unwanted thoughts and painful emotions. And we also receive regular requests for more information on Ayurveda and its teachings on calming the mind. And so the cool thing is this course is a place where we go in depth in both subjects. And we had a a lady called Nadine tell us that she listened to a sample of how to calm your fragile mind and she cried and she cried because it made more sense than any medical practitioner she's met in 38 years that our words instantly helped her. And she was so very thankful. There's nothing quite like hearing from somebody like that to know that we've been able to support them. How to Calm Your Fragile Mind is on sale through the end of February. You can save 25% off with the coupon code PEACE and get this course at anxietyslayer.teachable.com through the end of this month. I can completely relate to what Nadine said, and this happened for me when I first started studying Ayurveda, the relief in understanding more about my mind and not having my mind as my identity anymore, this teaching that we're not our mind and that we can work with the mind and and calm it and tame it was life-changing for me. It was a real pivotal moment that made me want to go more and more deeply into studying Ayurvedic psychology. And I really like the teachings we have in this course that they're so accessible yeah. and so easy to try and practice. Ayurveda is a treasure house of information for helping us calm our mind. And if you're listening today and you feel at the mercy of painful thoughts or an internal dialogue that's just rolling and rolling, I, I know for myself I've had nights or evenings where I'm just sitting with my hand on my head thinking, make it stop. Mm-hmm. Someone make it stop. These are the teachings that helped me make it stop. And I really hope that some of you listening will feel drawn to to try them out. And do let us know. Let us know how that works for you and the changes you're making on your own journey of recovering from anxiety. Thank you.